Hello, welcome back to part two of our look at uh, blood. Again, blood as a tissue uh, and an organ. Uh, we left off with our, at the end of the last video, talking about uh, the fact that this connective tissue, blood, uh, is made up of two components. Uh, the first component is that of plasma, uh, and the second component are these formed elements. And so that is where we are going to pick up our conversation uh, with this look of what exactly makes up these formed elements. And you can see here um, that we are really focusing in on Uh, this area right here. And so we're really looking at this area. All right. Again, uh, the overall uh, the, the overall uh, idea of these formed elements equaling about 45% of the total composition of blood. Um, and so uh, what makes up these formed elements? Well, we can see here uh, that we've got red blood cells, we have white blood cells, and we have these things called platelets, which are not true cells. All right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that here coming up. Um, but just as an idea, these are not true cells. Uh, red blood cells we're going to spend some time on as well, um, as they have an interesting uh, journey to function. All right, before they are actually released. Um, but you can see that uh, we have these guys right here, these red blood cells, these are erythrocytes, which make up about 99% of the total formed elements. And then we have our white blood cells, uh, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, and uh, you can see these respected uh, percentages. So uh, of our leukocytes, 60 to 70 percent of these are neutrophils, and we will talk about why that is coming up. Uh, about 20 to 25 percent are lymphocytes, 3 to 8 percent are monocytes, 2 to 4 percent are eosinophils, and uh, about 1 percent or less are basophils. And again, uh, we will discuss these uh, in a little bit more detail as we move through uh, this video. Uh, and so why don't we go ahead and uh, actually jump into that right now. Um, as I've already mentioned, right, red blood cells make up 99% uh, of the formed elements that we see. All right. Uh, and what I kind of want to focus on here are the neutrophils. Uh, or I'm sorry, over the uh, the leukocytes for just a few minutes, um, kind of give you a better idea of what we are dealing with, and so and this will help you in lab as well. Uh, neutrophils are your uh, what I like to refer to as your generalists. Right. In other words, um, or another way of of uh, defining them are your first responders. And so typically, um, the leukocytes that are sounding the alarm of concern that there's a pathogen, a virus, a bacteria, um, that there's an allergen, that there's a parasite, uh, that there is some kind of foreign cellular body that does not belong within you, uh, are the neutrophils. Um, and they can actually initiate uh, an immune response. They can initiate inflammatory responses, uh, and they can uh, initiate what we refer to as the um, um, the adaptive immunity response or adaptive immune response. Um, and so there's two types of responses that you can have within the immune system. You can have an innate response, which is kind of a built-in response, uh, and you can have an adaptive response. Um, and so the adaptive responses are actually uh, being driven by uh, your lymphocytes. Right? And uh, your lymphocytes come in two types. You have T cells and B cells. 
All right. And you can see that your lymphocytes make up about 20 to 25 percent of your overall uh, leukocyte count. Uh, and so it kind of makes sense that neutrophils would be 60 to 70 percent. If these are your generalist, if these are what's initiating other immune responses, uh, you would want them to be in a higher percentage uh, of your uh, leukocytes. And then your lymphocytes um, are uh, activated during things like cancer, um, severe infection, uh, they're initiated due to any kind of foreign antigen that may be uh, present within the body. Your lymphocytes are typically activated. Um, B cells in particular, uh, because they are the ones that directly produce antibodies, which we will talk about. All right. And so your lymphocytes uh, do major uh, immune response. Um, Again, cancer, any kind of uh, inflammatory response, anything that is antigen driven, uh, your lymphocytes are going to respond to. Monocytes, uh, monocytes are what we define as being uh, macrophages. They belong to the macrophage lineage. And so they're not true immune cells. Um, or they're not, yeah, they're not true immune cells, but they are part of the macrophage lineage. And you can see that they are three to 8% of the total uh, leukocyte count. And as any true macrophage would do, uh, these guys are involved in um, debris cleanup, damaged tissue cleanup, uh, where there's a high amount of cellular death, whether it is viral components, remember viruses are not living, um, but whether it's a viral component or whether it's a um, bacterial component, whatever it might be, macrophages are going to be involved with that cleanup. And uh, the remaining uh, 2 to 4, maybe 5% of your white blood cells are your eosinophils and your basophils. Uh, eosinophils are 2 to 4%, and we typically see these guys activated during parasitic infections, as well as allergy response. All right. And we're going to talk a little bit more, or, or in lab, you're learning a little bit more about what these guys actually look like um, as far as their components. And then we've got basophils, and your basophils are allergy response. All right. I will also mention that basophils, and this is something that's also mentioned within the lab, uh, your basophils um, can release or have the ability to release um, heparin, which is a blood thinner. Um, and they also have uh, the ability to uh, release um histamine, which is a bronchial and vasoconstrictor. Um, I'm sorry, it's a vasodilator, but a bronchial constrictor. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about why that is and why that makes sense uh, as we move through the lymphatic and the immune system. Um, but heparin is a blood thinner, histamine is a vasodilator and a bronchial constrictor. Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind here is that mast or uh, basophils um, will migrate very often uh, out of the lymphatic and circulatory system and into tissue, uh, such as the dermis. Uh, and when uh, basophils migrate out of the lymphatic and the blood and into the tissue, they are what we refer to as mast cells. And so mast cells and basophils are pretty much the same thing. Um, they do have the ability, mast cells do have the ability to repopulate within uh, tissue separate from the basophils, but the, the initial populations are actually created as basophils are migrating outward. Um, and then you got platelets, which are cell fragments. Uh, I want to stress that platelets are not true cells. 
Right. And the reason why they are not true cells is because uh, you're taking some um, cytoplasm and you're covering it with a membrane, but there is no nucleus. They have no ability to reproduce. Um, they don't have any regulatory functions necessarily uh, outside of aiding in the formation of a blood clot. Um, and the other thing I will throw out is um, red blood cells tend to outnumber white blood cells on a ratio of 700 to one. So for every uh, one white blood cell or leukocyte that you have, the body has approximately 700 red blood cells. And so that's a huge um, uh, comparison, if you would, um, or ratio, right? 700 to one, 700 red blood cells for every one uh, white blood cell that is present within the body. So uh, just a little bit of information here on the um, platelets right, as we continue through here. So uh, all of our cell types uh, actually start out as other cell types and have to go through a um, have to go through a uh, development process, if you would, or stages of development. And uh, platelets are no different. Right? Platelets are no different. Uh, before a platelet is actually a platelet, before a platelet is a cell fragment, it starts out as a megakaryocyte. And megakaryocytes um, are these um, rather large cells that you can every now and then sometimes see within blood smears. Uh, and what will happen is they get to a certain size and under the direction of hormonal control and regulation, um, basically uh, the hormone that we are dealing with is a hormone called thrombopoietin. There's a term for you, thrombopoietin. All right. uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here on, on some upcoming slides. Um, but thrombopoietin drives the development and the eventual splitting up of megakaryocytes. And when a megakaryocyte divides and splinters, uh, it splinters into about 2,000 to 3,000 smaller fragments. And so think about taking a, um, a, a rather large dinner plate and dropping it onto the floor and having it shatter into a couple thousand pieces. All right, you started with a plate uh, after it shatters into all of those various pieces, you no longer have a you no longer have a um, a plate. You've got pieces of a plate. All right, uh, and so just like when this large cell uh, splinters up, you no longer have a cell, but you've got pieces of a cell. And uh, because they are cell pieces and cell fragments and not true cells, uh, they don't tend to live very long, uh, mainly because, mainly because they, uh, there's no nucleus to drive <clears throat> uh, any kind of cellular division. So short lifespan, um, five to nine days is about it. Um, they are actually not more numerous than white blood cells. That is a typo on here, they are indeed um, uh, less numerous, less than 1% of your overall formed elements are platelets. Um, not much mass to them, mainly because there's no organelles. Again, you've got some granules in there, you've got some cytoplasm, and you've got a membrane, uh, a protein membrane that is surrounding them. Um, they do have chemicals inside of them, and the chemicals um, the proteins that are inside of them are what we define as being granules, and specifically those granules are uh, what we define as being interleukins. And we will deter, we will come to find out that there's about 40 different types of interleukins uh, that we have. And uh, Platelets secrete and and uh, release um, 
certain kinds of interleukins. And the reason for those interleukins that are uh, released are because of uh, the need to promote blood clotting. And so this is exactly where we see that functionality coming into play. Um, and so uh, platelets do have the ability to release these proteins that are interleukins. Um, there are cytokines, in other words, uh, they stimulate um, a response usually from other cells that are nearby. And one of those responses is clotting. Um, <clears throat> we've spent a lot of time talking about leukocytes. Let's spend a few minutes talking about uh, red blood cells <clears throat> or erythrocytes, um, just so that way everybody is uh, not feeling left out of the fun, so to speak. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and we will um, wrap up here for our second video after we talk a little bit about um, an introduction into the red blood cells. So. Uh, we know that from our look at lab and, and doing some lab activities uh, that uh, one of the things that we can measure is the percentage of erythrocytes or red blood cells within the blood. And that percentage of red blood cells, erythrocytes that's found within the blood, is what we define as hematocrit. Um, so the hematocrit is the percentage of erythrocytes found within the blood. And there is a difference in that percentage between males and females. And this should be a, not a zero, but that should be a little line there. And so in females, um, the hematocrit range is anywhere between 38 and 46%. Uh, and for males, it's about 40% to 54%. Um, you'll see some variation within that. Uh, and that is because it kind of depends on uh, the ages of the individuals. And so there's a little bit of floating um, variance with these ranges, as with anything within the body. Um, but the reason why males um, have a higher hematocrit uh, than females has to do with testosterone. And that's because testosterone stimulates the production of red blood cells in response to low oxygen levels in the blood. So uh, oxygen O2 levels drop within the blood, the concentration decreases, that stimulates the release of testosterone from the adrenal gland, and that directly stimulates the production of red blood cells through the release of a hormone called erythropoietin. Uh, erythropoietin is actually released by the kidneys. And so if we think about um, the relationship of the adrenal gland to the kidneys, we know that the adrenal gland sits right on top of the kidneys. And so um, the kidneys detect a drop in, in uh, O2 concentration, stimulates the release of testosterone from within the adrenal gland. Um, testosterone stimulates the release of erythropoietin, EPO, and that in turn... Uh, will go ahead and travel through the blood to the bone marrow to begin the differentiation of stem cells to eventually lead to the production of erythrocytes or new red blood cells. Um, and in fact, uh, we see that there's about 2 million new red blood cells that will enter circulation every second, every second. Um, you're learning in lab that when um, you have a low hematocrit, in other words, when things are like microcytic and those red blood cells are misshapen or very small, that that can lead to things like anemic right, or anemia, um, which is uh, usually a lower uh, the normal percentage of either red blood cells or hemoglobin. Uh, and so this is all starting to tie in now and hopefully starting to make a little bit more sense um, as you're going through the lab material and now mirroring that with what we're doing within a lecture. Um, as, a, as a point of reference, um, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're dealing with here, one drop of blood... in males 
uh, contains about 270 million red blood cells. And for a female, uh, one drop of blood uh, is, uh, will contain about 240 million red blood cells. And so um, there is some differences that are there. Uh, males tend to have a higher hematocrit level because testosterone levels free floating, free um, free testosterone within the blood tends to be higher because males are also secreting testosterone from the testis, uh, which females obviously, hopefully you've realized, do not have. And so uh, that hematocrit percentage tends to be higher in males because of a higher instance of testosterone, which produces a higher release of urethropoietin, which stimulates more uh, red blood cell production. Um, which is good because males tend to be more muscular. They tend to be larger, um, taller, have a higher body mass. And so oxygen consumption is also higher. So the two of those things actually relate. Higher levels of testosterone, higher body mass, higher oxygen consumption because of ATP production and usage. And so therefore, um, we would expect there to be more erythropoietin, red blood cells, hemoglobin, and all that kind of good stuff associated with that. Uh, and the last thing that I will leave you with <clears throat> for today is kind of a review of something uh, that you've probably touched on in AMP1, maybe, maybe not. Um, but that is a red blood cell production. Uh, the, the formal process is what we define as being hematopoiesis. Right? So hematopoiesis is the production or the process of the production of red blood cells. And that does start during fetal development. And so in the in the fetus, um, the liver is producing red blood cells. The spleen is producing red blood cells. The thymus is producing red blood cells. The lymph nodes are producing red blood cells. The tonsils are producing uh, red blood cells. All of the bone, uh, once the second trimester starts, uh, is uh, producing red blood cells. And that's because you have rapid growth and development. Um, every inch of new blood vessel that is laid down during fetal development uh, increases the need for the production of more red blood cells uh, just to be able to keep up with growth and metabolism demands. Right? Uh, one of the things that I say very often in AMP1 is you're always one second away from death. Right? In other words, uh, that loss of homeostasis that leads to death, you're always one second away. Uh, and so if you have, uh, think about this, rapid periods of growth and development, we see this in the skeletal system um, and the, with the, with the regulation of the hormone um, uh, osteocalcin. Um, one of the things that we see here is during fetal development, rapid growth and development. And so that rate of red blood cell production has to match that growth, that, that rapid growth and development process that's happening. Otherwise, not enough red blood cells, not enough oxygen, not enough ATP production going on. Homeostasis is now out of whack. Uh, you're not getting rid of carbon dioxide as efficiently. You're not producing enough bicarbonate ions, so your pH is off, and the fetus dies. Um, and so you're always one second away from loss of homeostatic mechanism or control and regulation, which means you're always one second away from death. Um, and the only thing that keeps us from dying is the ability to maintain homeostasis. Uh, and so we see all of this red blood cell production that is happening um, during, oops, during uh, fetal development. That is happening right there. And so all through this period right here, this is all fetal development. All right. Uh, and then after birth, which is where this line is, uh, the majority of the red blood cell production uh, shifts from, we know we're not producing uh, red blood cells in the liver or the spleen, uh, that yolk sac is long gone, uh, lymph nodes are not doing this, tonsils are not doing this, the thymus is not doing that. We know that after birth, uh, that that red blood cell production shifts to red bone marrow solely. And that's what you're seeing right here. Right? You're seeing at the time of birth, uh, the production of red blood cells shifts strictly to 
the bones and the red bone marrow. And that red bone marrow is in every bone uh, as an adolescent. Um, and then once you are old and you're into your adult years, uh, typically right here, right around the age of 20 to about 25, um, your red bone marrow in uh, your long bones, um, specifically the shafts of the long bones have now been converted over to um, yellow bone marrow, higher levels of adipocytes. You're not producing uh, red blood cells anymore. Uh, and so now you're only producing red blood cells as an old person. Again, old is being defined uh, about 25 years old. Um, so most of you, all of you are already past your prime. You're all almost there. Um, some of you are long past 25. And so um, we shift that production of red blood cells um, to your flat bones. Um, so bones of the cranium, the scapula, the sternum, um, the clavicle. Uh, the ribs, the vertebrae, and the ends of your long bones, the epiphysis. And so that is what we see uh, with red blood cell production. And so we're going to stop there. Uh, our next uh, video uh, is going to look at exactly how we make red blood cells. What is this process of red blood cell production? Uh, and if we have time, we'll get into the structure of the red blood cells as well. And so uh, I'm going to give you some time to, uh, once again, review this, uh, maybe go back over and look at your questions, see what you got right, see what you got wrong, um, jot down any notes that you have. Again, I'm always available for questions, uh, and I may even have answers for those questions. And so uh, go to it. Keep studying. You're doing well. I know we're just starting, but you're doing well. And uh, I will see you on the flip side.